Yo, what's going on, everybody? It is Friday, yeah, February 9th. I don't ordinarily do a video this early in the day, but there was a subject I wanted to talk about. Actually, it's a subject that I've spoken about several times, many times maybe in the past, and that is short-term trading. But before I get into that topic, I want to mention to you guys, those of you who don't know a little bit about my background, I spent many years as an independent floor trader on four different futures exchanges. I was on the uh, New York uh, Futures Exchange in 1982, then I, I went over to the NYMEX trading the whole petroleum complex, and then I became a member of the COMEX trading gold, silver, and copper, and eventually I moved on to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange where I was an S&P trader, and, and so I've had a lot of experience you know, back in the day, back in the day, and it, all this stuff predates uh, electronic trading, it predates Globex, it predates these algorithmic uh, traders that you have today. And that was really, if you talk about the realm of short-term trading, I mean, that was the shortest short-term trading that anybody could do. Uh, those of us who were standing on the exchange floor in those trading pits, I mean, we literally had the ability to react instantaneously. We saw the order flow and we didn't pay any commissions or so very, very tiny commissions, fractional if you were an exchange member, which I was on all those places. So that was really, I mean, if you talk about talking about short term trading, I had a lot of exposure to that. And I hope you guys will listen to what I'm saying now. And I also hope that I get to touch on every aspect of short-term trading that I want to talk about. So let's get into it. I, I think a lot of people are, when they, when they hear about short-term trading and markets, you know, they're drawn to that because it conjures up this idea in their heads of fast money, quick money. I've always said that the real motivation behind that even though people might think it's, you know, making money and generating a steady income from the market for yourself. Uh, the motivation is really like the action, the excitement. You might think, people might think, well, it's about the money, but it's really about the action and the excitement. And I'll, I'll explain that further. Uh, before, I, before I even, um, go into this in more depth, I will tell you that in all my years as a floor trader, with the exception of several times where I had kind of like inside information, I never really made any money. I mean, there were, there were days I made some, there were days I, I, I lost some. You know, when I started out on the, on the knife, the New York Futures Exchange in 1982, it was really the beginning of stock index futures and the knife had pretty good order flow. I mean, we were, we were owned by the New York Stock Exchange. And in fact, we were physically connected to the big board, the New York Stock Exchange. Um, you know, we had a little exchange and then if you walked across like a, a hallway, it was really kind of like a covered bridge. It was connected to the floor of the big board, the New York Stock Exchange. But we had good order flow and in the beginning I was able to stand in the pit and I was able to buy at the bid and sell at the offer. So it was like a cash machine for me every day. I was able to pretty much make one tick, if I was lucky, two ticks on every trade. And worst case scenario, I would scratch or break even. And then what happened was that order flow started to dry up and it went to Chicago to the S&P um, for very good reason. I mean. Chicago was really the leader in promoting uh, futures trading and activity and they were much more savvy and the New York Stock Exchange, they didn't care about us. You know, for them it was the big board, it was the New York Stock Exchange. We were like their, their unwanted, uh, you know, cousin or something like that. So they really didn't support the business there. Anyway, the business went to uh, Chicago and when that happened, that order flow that I had gotten used to and which I was making money from every day that dried up and I started to lose. I, I wasn't able to, you know, 
be a market maker and buy at the bid and sell at the offer. I had to try to, you know, guess market direction and I was terrible. Um, and so I moved on to the NYMEX and at that time I had a friend who was working for a, a major oil company, I'm not gonna mention the name, and he said to me, we had this arrangement where he said, Mike, uh, whenever we do business, and because they were an oil, they were a major oil company, you know, their trades in the market were very big. They were able to move the market at least, you know, in, in a short time span by a, by a decent amount. He used to call me up and say, Mike, I'm, I'm about to buy a bunch of heating oil or I'm about to buy a bunch of gasoline. They, they mostly were trading in refined products, not in crude. Uh, go in there. So I would go in if he was going to buy, come in and buy you know, heating oil, I'd go in, I'd buy 50 or 100 contracts for myself, I'd go out of the pit, and then he'd come in and he would, uh, you know, jack up the price with his buying, and then I'd come in and I'd sell out. And, you know, when, when I had that arrangement, I made a lot of money, and you could understand why. That's like, you know, that's like in insider trading. Okay, and it was it was not illegal. It might have been unethical at the time, but it was not illegal in the commodity markets. And I bring this point up because two reasons. All of the people that I have ever known, not all, but I would say the vast majority of the traders who I have known over the years when I was a, a floor trader, the ones who made big, big money, and I'm talking about, you know, multi-millions, which back in those days was a lot of money. They had connections like that. They had that inside information. I mean, the gold pit in the, on the COMEX in, in the uh, night, late 70s and the early 80s was notorious for this, where brokers who were executing big orders and remember, that was a big time for the gold and silver market. You had the Hunt brothers trying to corner the silver market. Gold was, uh, you know, we, we delinked the dollar from the international gold standard in 71. So these brokers would have big orders on their books, at least back in those days, they were big orders. And they wouldn't even go into the pit to execute these orders. They would just cross you know, a customer order, if it was a market order, they would just sell it to themselves and then go in and, and you know, uh, um, sell it out to somebody else. So they made huge amounts of money, but again, that was kind of like a form of cheating. So what I'm saying is, the only people that I ever saw making money, short-term trading, including myself, were people who had some kind of edge some kind of, whether that be insider information, crossing orders against their own book, whatever, okay? So, and then there was a very, very small number of traders who I knew or who I observed who didn't have that connection. There were small traders, but they were very, very disciplined and they would come in every day and make like a salary for themselves. They weren't rich like these other guys I was talking about who had that inside information, but they were able to eke out like an annual salary for themselves, but they were extremely disciplined, okay? I mean, they would cut their losses. They could have like many, many small little losses in a row and then you know, this kind of thing, and they would make some money. So they were extremely, extremely dis disciplined, but though they were rare. They were very rare. And the vast majority, when you strip out these guys who had the edge, who had the inside information, and the very small group of uh, small traders who were able to eke out like a salary for themselves, the rest, just kind of went away. They couldn't make it. They never made any money over a period of time. 
And now I extrapolate this to nowadays, okay, where I, I, I hear people and I talk to people and sometimes they come to me because they're, they're interested in MMT or whatever, and it's like, nah, this is not for me. I, I need something to help me with the short-term trading. The real motivation that I have found in dealing with people when it comes to this desire to focus on short-term trading is not really about money. It's not really about profitability, even though that's what they'll tell you if you talk to them. And they'll, you know, they'll tell you that adamantly, that yes, I'm in this to make money. But in reality, the true motivation, the true factor, the true driving force behind that desire to short term is really action. They need that action. They need to feel like they're involved all the time. It gives them something. It's a dopamine rush. It's maybe something to talk about at, at a cocktail party. Yeah. Uh, what do you do for a living? I'm a trader. You know, I sit at a screen every day and I watch the, and I have 20 screens in front of me and, you know, this kind of thing. Nowadays is, no, I'm telling you this right now, folks. Nowadays is no different than the days when I was a floor trader, except that there's no more floor anymore where you have, you know, independent traders and order uh, people executing orders down on an exchange floor. Now everything is electronic. And it's the same setup. It's just now done with computers. I mean, we literally have that same front running that I described to you when my friend was calling me up saying, hey, Mike, I'm going to buy, you know, 200 contracts of heating oil. Go in there and get some for yourself. I mean, now it's these algo traders who they pay brokerage firms like Schwab and TD Ameritrade and all, you know, they pay them to look at the order flow and they have their, you know, super fast computers positioned right at the exchanges. I, I, I think, uh, you know, some of these companies that do these algorithmic trading, uh, you know, operations that have these operations, they spend tens of millions on, you know, the most advanced computers and putting them right at the exchanges. So like we're talking about nanoseconds ahead of the order. They see the order flow. They jump in front of it. As soon as the orders get executed, they sell it out again. And they do this thousands of times a day. The idea that you as some little independent trader can sit there in your house or your office or whatever, or, you know, on your phone and think that you're going to be able to beat this system is exactly the same type of a situation as what I described earlier, where very, very few people in the pits, in the trading pits back in my day, really made any money. It was only the guys who were connected or a very, very small group of uh, traders who were super, super disciplined. And believe me, they weren't rich. They made like a salary for themselves, okay? So it was a choice for them. They, they were independent. You know, they came to work at the exchange every day. It was a grind. They eked out a salary for themselves every year, all right? This idea that, you know, there's some magical system out there whereby you can do this every day, short term, it's just a fantasy. You know, I, I call it the system fairy. Now, what I learned after all my years of experience, and again, this goes back to years and years as an independent floor trader, it's... <laughs> The, the wealth is accumulated in the long run. I've used in the past Warren Buffett as an example of this. He's what, he's like the fifth uh, richest guy in the world or the sixth. He's in the top 10 there. Um, and now he is so, if, if you compare him to any 
what I would call, let's say a, a short term investor, let's call it like a hedge fund manager. I don't know who's the richest hedge fund manager. It might be this guy, uh, Simons, who runs Renaissance Technology. He's super, his approach is super mathematical. He's some kind of like math genius. He used to work, I think, for the NSA. But anyway, Warren Buffett's wealth is so far beyond, and, and this guy, Simons, I forget his first name. Uh, but you know who I'm talking about, Renaissance Technologies. That's his hedge fund. Warren Buffett is so far ahead of this guy in terms of wealth. And the other um, hedge fund managers, and it's really even not correct to use their wealth as uh, a barometer of their success because I've said to you guys, you know, like a million times, if a guy is managing $10 billion, which is not even a big hedge fund, just from the management fee and the percentage of the profit share that they get, you know, it takes them like three years on a $10 billion fund, three, four years to become a billionaire. And that's without really any returns whatsoever or very meager returns. Like if they were to put all that money that they manage into like, you know, a risk-free asset like a treasury. So don't, it's not even right to go by that. I mean, Warren Buffett, you're talking about a hundred and what, 116 billion or something like that. Investing over time, over the course of his life in very plain vanilla stocks. I mean, for a long time, and this might still be true, I don't know, but for a long time, his biggest holding was like Coca-Cola. He never did anything like, I'm going to find the next Amazon, or I'm going to find the next Google, or I'm going to find the next Apple. Was never involved in that stuff. Wealth is about time, okay? And, and when, you, when you get fixated on this short term, first of all, that's like a gambling mentality, okay? It's like, I need to make money fast. I run into this all the time and, and believe me, I did the same thing or I had the same, you know, attitude in the beginning of my career. Like I need to make money like yesterday. I need to make money right away. Like every day I need to make money. And the problem is like when I started out, as I said earlier, I, I got a little bit of a taste of that because I would go down to my job to the uh, New York Futures Exchange every day. And I was, I was making money every single day, but I was a market maker, okay? I wasn't getting rich off of making one tick on every trade, but every day I came home like with some cash in my account until that dried up. And then I had to like guess where the market was going. And I went through every kind of system you can imagine from, you know, uh, regular charts to, to Fibonacci to Elliott Wave to, I mean, you name it, uh, you know, you name it, <laughs> you know, moving averages, stochastics, relatives, all this kind of shit. It's a gambling mentality and it's going to get you nowhere. You know, some, look, some people win the lottery. I get it, but the odds of you winning the lottery are like zero. People always say, people ask me, you play the lottery? I don't play the lottery. It's only a dollar. I don't care. I'll keep the dollar. Why? Because I'm not going to win. How do you know somebody wins? Yeah, but it's not going to be me and it's not going to be you. I mean, there are better things to spend your time on. And this idea of, hey, I want to be a short-term trader, maybe a day trader. I mean, it, it's just like a fantasy story. Like the pro also, I have to say, which, which it's very detrimental, is that you see a lot of these things now on social media, like which are basically people selling systems. It's the people who are selling the systems. They're making money because they're, they're um, 
taking advantage of people who think like this is some kind of holy grail and it's going to get them to make big money very quick day in and day out. It's not going to happen. It's way, way more in your interest to think about being a long-term investor, to understand value, to understand the macroeconomic environment, to have patience. You're still gonna need discipline, okay? But it's not the kind of discipline that you're gonna need if you're gonna be in that 0.1% uh, of short-term traders who maybe make it or make a salary for themselves, and that's excruciating, okay? I don't, I don't really know anyone personally anymore who has the ability to do that because it's like you're gonna take little losses all the time, loss after loss after loss, some gains and loss after loss. I mean, most people don't have the, they don't have the constitution for that. They don't, they don't have, you know, that just, that just is draining. That just weighs on you, man. And, and you lose confidence and it weakens you. You know, you don't wanna be, I mean, I always talk about being involved in stuff that is uncomfortable. Okay, facing discomfort. But not like that, because that's like, you're wasting your energy and you're wasting your time. And again, it may be true that some people succeed at that, just like it's true that some people win the lottery, but you're not going to be able to do it. And I, I'm telling you this from decades of experience that I have, which I've engaged in it personally. And I don't consider myself a stupid person. Actually, I consider myself as an analyst pretty good, but I have all the same flaws, human flaws and weaknesses as everybody else, you know, I, I had to rein that in. And believe me, the, the way to rein that in is not by thinking that your path to wealth and riches and some kind of glory is short-term trading. It's just not. I mean, take a step back, work on patience, work on seeing the big picture, I've said it before that this game is a simple, simple game. There's no reason to make it harder. What's hard, I said, is, you know, you controlling you, the mental aspect, behavior. That's hard because we're all prone to the same kind of stupid human behavior, which is, you know, greed and fear and impatience. But I gotta say it again, that, that anyone who has this desire, like I wanna be a short-term trader, that's just a gambler's mentality. That's just the inner you wanting action. You might be telling yourself, or you might be telling your friends or your family or your colleagues, I'm in this to make big money, believe me. Number one, you're not gonna make big money. And number in short-term trading, you're not. You will make big money as an investor. A smart, informed, savvy investor who has self-control. You're not going to make big money as a short-term trader. You're not even going to make a salary for yourself. I hate to tell you. So, it's coming from a guy, I've been through it, folks. I've been through it and I don't want to bust your bubble on it. And again, yeah, maybe some people succeed at it. I, I've seen a huge cross section of people attempt this. I, this was, it's what I did for years and years and years. Okay, And even when I moved off the floor, I continued to try to do this and develop this. And again, I don't think I'm stupid. I think I'm a pretty good analyst. But 
I'm subject to the same weaknesses and flaws as everyone else who is a human being. And I'm just, I'm telling you guys, I'm asking you guys to listen and focus on what's really going to take you there. And believe me, when I tell you this, it's not short-term trading. Now, unless you have a buddy or a connection or you got $20 million to put your, you know, supercomputers uh, at the CME or at the New York Stock Exchange, oh, go for it. And even those guys, I mean, go go look up, like I knew the guy who started Virtue Financial, V-I-R-T -I is the symbol. Uh, Vincent Viola, he was actually, he was a, a, a colleague of mine when I was a NYMEX trader and he eventually became the chairman of the NYMEX. I knew him. He started Virtue Financial, which is one of these algo trading shops. If you look at their stock, V-I-R-T, it hasn't done a whole lot. That doesn't mean they don't make money. They all make money. They make money, but it's like the stock shows you, you know, it's a choppy ride. Even these guys who have tens of millions to buy equipment and situate their computers and front run the orders. I mean, why do you want to do that? And to think that you can, you can beat these guys? So don't do it. I mean, unless you have some kind of inside information, I don't know if you have a friend who works at, you know, one of these big physical commodity trading companies, uh, Glenn, uh, I forget even some of these guys' names, or an oil company or something like that. Or you have somebody at a central bank, the Russian central bank, the Chinese central bank, who's telling you, yeah, we're going to go in and buy, you know, 50,000 ounces of gold right here. I mean, unless you have that kind of connection, you're just deluding yourself. Really. And it, or at least be honest to yourself and say, you know why I'm doing this? It's not to make money. I need the dopamine rush. I need to sit there with my 20 screens and then talk to my friends about how, yeah, I'm a trader. Because that sounds cool and, and like romantic and, and exciting. At least be honest. I'm a big believer in honesty. Anyway, uh, that's probably my longest video, but uh, I hope you listen to it and I hope you learn something from it. And um, I'm here to help you guys, but don't sabotage yourself. And don't think there's some magical system or holy grail. And please, please don't think that little you sitting there in your office is going to beat these, these setups, these companies that have a built-in advantage. And that's the only way they make money. Because if you took away their advantage, and even with their advantage, they're not that, that profitable. Okay? Even with that advantage. So, I mean, come on. Get real. Bye.